everyone and welcome back. It's time for the third episode of the Historically Accurate Victorian Aziraphale cosplay and it is time to move on to the waistcoat and coat because no new woman of the 1890s would be complete without her tailored pieces. In fact, it's the tailored pieces in women's wardrobe in the 1890s that is so terribly distinct. Prior to around the 1880s, most of the tailored goods that were made for women were riding habits. If you go back all the way to the 17th century or earlier, tailors did make all of women's clothing as well as all of men's clothing, basically anything that was fitted to the person, not uh, unstructured, unfitted you know, accessories and basic things like that. But when the new gown style of mantuas came onto the scene in the late 17th century, mantua makers appear to make this new unstructured, less fitted style of gown, and the tailors took over only making stays, court dresses, and riding habits for women. And riding habits continue to be very masculine in their styling for that reason. Tailors were not going to reinvent everything that they were doing in order to make this slightly different type of garment. So it's not until we really reach the 1880s that we start seeing women wearing suits. Things that are not specifically riding habits, and the difference that they're not just for the wealthy who can afford a very specialized costume, but instead they're becoming the practical option, particularly for the middle class. And this is because in an era where gowns are covered in trim and ruffles and yards and yards of fabric, and the style is constantly updating and changing and people are trying to keep up, a really simple, basic suit with its tailored elements doesn't go out of style very quickly, and if it's made out of decent quality fabric from a decent quality tailor, it can last quite a few years before it is worn out. So there was a new option on the scene in the 1880s, and the tailors picked up on that interest and ran with it. This is not only seen in the number of tailors that are advertising as doing women's wear as of this point. They have whole discussions over it, but also the fact that we're seeing a huge boom of department stores that really started up in the 1850s. And by the time we reach the 1880s, it's feasible for a lot of people to be accustomed to getting their clothing by walking into a department store and having an exchange done there where the clothing isn't necessarily going to be off the rack like we're used to today, but they aren't having everything custom made from scratch. They'll have a few styles they can choose from, and then they can have that altered and fitted to them precisely at the store. So these department stores actually have workshops in them. Because they're just so large, it makes sense. And they will have dressmakers as well as tailors, and perhaps even other specialists working for that one shop, which means that they can put out a wide variety of styles and a large quantity of garments as well. So suddenly suits for women are available. They're encouraged. They're practical. They're still fashionable. They're easy to move around in. They're usually made as walking suits, walking skirt lengths, things that are easier for everyday function. And they're available wherever people live, whether it's a custom tailor or department stores or catalogs from department stores. So no matter where you are, you have access to these things and they are affordable. So suits take off for women. They are all the rage as we reach into the 1890s. And we go from having tailored styles of bodices and basques to tailored jackets and coats, things that are decidedly more like menswear in their styling and didn't really exist in popular women's fashion nearly so much before this. So there's a huge range of masculine tailored options for women. And not surprisingly, there are a lot of opinions about this as well. There's concerns over women being more mannish than they should be, more masculine, wearing men's clothing. What is that going to lead to next? And it does tie in a lot with the imagery that we expect to see see when it comes to women's suffrage and other women's rights. So there's definitely a connection between the more tailored style for women as well as the new woman, modern woman, suffragette, whatever it may be. And that association does continue for quite a few years, but suits find their way into everyday wardrobes for so many women, even for those that aren't participating in that type of culture. It just becomes a practical and comfortable fashion item that allows women a lot more freedom of movement and a lot less weight of the structure and everything else that goes with it. So this is 
the boom, the height of these amazing things. And it is one of my favorite eras for fashion for that reason. And I chose for my version of Aziraphale, where we're digging into the new woman concept, those that would be going to women's clubs in the 1890s, riding bicycles and doing all of those new things, that a waistcoat seemed perfectly appropriate, not just because Aziraphale is wearing a waistcoat that is relatively iconic in the series, but also because it is something that is mentioned over and over again as a potential option here. That's gonna be made out of a silk velvet based pretty closely off of this image. This was my favorite pick from all of the research that I did. The coat is also going to heavily resemble this image as well. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge, I think, in terms of fit, since I couldn't find exactly what I wanted in drafting manuals. I had to combine a few things, and I think some of them intend for me to have a much larger skirt underneath. So we'll see how everything turns out in the end. If you want to see more about the fitting process, I talked about that in the first episode where I showed some of the mock-ups as well. So we're going to launch right into the construction for this episode and I'll talk a little bit about some of the pattern alterations for the coat that I had to do as well. And I have to say now that I have finished the coat and I have actually gotten a chance to wear it a few times, it might be one of my new favorite pieces. It is just absolutely perfect with both modern and historical garments. And I definitely want to make more tailored garments from the 1890s now. Starting off with the silk velvet waistcoat. I'm using an antique silk velvet, which we'll have some problems we'll talk about later. And for the inner lining layers of canvas, I'm having trouble finding a really good linen canvas right now. There's just a shortage. So I'm trying out this alternate wool blend, which is pretty similar. In the case of the canvas layers, Unlike the external layers where we want to stitch a dart and then open it up flat, instead I'm going to be overlaying the dart and overlaying the seam so that way I don't end up with not only bulk there, but something that's trying to fight back and spring back. A lot of canvas has some resistance, so I don't want to work against that. In fact, I'd rather work with it and strengthen those areas. So I'm overlapping and zigzagging. This is the fastest way to do it by machine. You can also go in and cat stitch down by hand, but it works pretty well with machine as long as you have a canvas that isn't prone to stretching as you stitch it which ideally it's a canvas, so you wouldn't. And then I'm able to go in and do that center front seam as well as the dart for the velvet. At this point, the velvet is really easy to work with. I'm finding that if I'm putting face to face, they grip really well and hold together. Everything's super friendly. In fact, it's almost like Velcro. It grips to itself so well. So that means that I'm having an easy time when I'm putting these velvet seams together. Here I'm clipping around the curves, offsetting my clips in order to make sure I don't end up with any corners. And then I'm basting around the inside of the lapel just to make sure that nothing shoots back and forth. Next up, I'm trying to do all this by machine. So I'm adding in that canvas layer and machine basting it around all the edges. Then I'm going back and machine stitching in the lapel where it needs to be. Everything at this point is going decently well. Then it's time for the lining. I am doing the same thing to the lining that I did to all the other pieces, adding in the darts, doing up the center front seams. And the nice thing is this lining is so similar to the velvet color, I don't feel like I need to do a whole bunch of facings. However, this is a point where I realize something's going poorly. You can see it curling as I am stitching forward. No matter how much pinning I did, it was not holding in place. And I can't baste through this velvet. You put any stitches in it, they are permanently there, even if you didn't iron them in. So I've realized at this point, I have to hand stitch everything. And on top of not being able to put any temporary stitches through the velvet, I also couldn't do any ironing. Usually you can use a scrap of the same velvet and it works pretty well. This stuff did not like that at all. Lots of lines, lots of dents. It just wasn't going to be an option. So I trimmed back the seam allowances of the canvas, laid it down, carefully pinned it in a few places that won't be visible. And now I'm going through and starting off with the open neck seam, which I did manage to do successfully on the machine, and I'm just whipping it down to just the canvas. Same thing around all of the outside edges as well. The velvet gets pulled over and whipped down. These stitches only go through the canvas layer of the garment, holding it into place, but not visible on the exterior. 
then I'm able to lay the lining on top and I'm going to go and hand stitch around the entire exterior of the garment, slip stitch everything into place. So that way there won't be visible stitches on the exterior at the velvet, I won't be marring the velvet or damaging it in any way, and it won't be slip sliding around a whole bunch. So I ended up having to do a lot more hand stitching on this than I wanted to, but it's okay in the end. Then time to move on to the backs, which are made entirely out of that lining fabric, two darts in the back, as well as a center back seam, and then it's time to add the fronts to the backs. So first things first, the fronts get laid down velvet side to the backs, stitched at the shoulders, and stitched at the sides. This was a little bit difficult to do, but I fought through it, at which point I'm able to add the second layer of the back, the lining layer, and that sandwiches and get stitched around everything except for that one side seam. And then I'm able to pull the entire thing out through the one side seam like magic. This is my favorite thing when it comes to doing vests or any sort of sleeveless lined garment. The fact that you were able to just pull it all out magically and the armholes are done, everything's finished. It's absolutely wonderful because all you have to do is stitch up one side seam in the end. I then am moving on to the buttonholes. I'm using my tiny snips here because they allow me to get in to the end of this buttonhole and turn it into a keyhole buttonhole. Yes, I could get out my punches and punch a little circle down at the end. I even have a keyhole buttonhole punch, but honestly, just cutting a little diamond shape at the end when it's a softer fabric like this works really well. So that's what I ended up doing instead to get that ideal shape going through with a mid-weight silk twist in order to get a really fine buttonhole and then stitching on the antique buttons that I found that resemble the originals on that Aziraphale is wearing in the series. Though his are slightly different, these I feel like give a very similar vibe. And the last step is slip stitching up that side seam in order to cover it all up. And then we are on to the coat. Construction wise, I am actually using this antique garment as one of my references. I recently acquired this, and though it is definitely a uh, younger girls, it's going to have very similar construction methods, very similar shape to what I want to do. Reminder that when I did the mock-up, I had a few changes to make, so we can see that in the pattern. The changes that I made were to shift from these lines here over. So I tilted the angle of the shoulder further in. The reason why this works to alleviate the pull lines here or to alleviate the gapping here, because it changes those numbers. So this was the point where we were at, and this is the point that I moved to. So the difference is from there to there. So we've gained over half an inch. We can measure the roll line that runs up. So from down here, the roll line went all the way up to here. So that is just a little over 12 and a half. And if we do the same thing for the roll line that's new, it's just over 12. So we lost half an inch in this length here, meaning it will gap less. So shifting the shoulder this direction will lengthen this and shorten this. We're just changing that triangle and doing the opposite will lengthen this and shorten that. And then it's time to get to cutting. I am cutting out of a very friendly wool. Thankfully this time after working with that velvet, this is so much easier. I'm using the same canvas type for the interfacing here. And just like before, I don't want to include it in the seam allowances. This stuff does okay if stitched into the seam allowances, but it's just a little bulkier than I want. So for the pocket flaps, I'm basting it down to the wool first and then adding the lining layer. I can stitch all the way around right up against the edge of the canvas. It gives me a really clean edge of where to cut. I'm trimming away some of that excess for the seam allowance just because I don't need that much bulk. And then I can very carefully fold and turn those corners. I'm not worried about the fact that the canvas is only basted in right now. We'll take care of that in the next step once I get everything turned and pressed. Then it's on to the top stitching. This is an era of so much top stitching when it comes to tailoring because it honestly is a bit of a shortcut. So not only is there top stitching right up against the edge, but there's another line of top stitching about a quarter inch in from that. 
So there's going to be two lines of top stitching around everything, which means that I don't have to worry about catching the interfacing in the fronts or the pocket flaps or the cuffs, anything like that. It's all going to be machine stitched down. So you can see I have a fairly large canvas for the front there, but it doesn't extend all the way over to the sides. It does go past the pocket opening, which is a good thing because that will actually help support the weight of the pocket and anything I put into it. We don't want saggy pockets. So I go ahead and baste the canvas in, making sure it's not going to move, and then figure out the exact placement of the pocket, lay down the little welt at the bottom with the line for the stitching and the pocket flap on top, also with a line for where I'm going to be stitching. I'm not doing the entire box for this one, just the top and bottom. The sides are left open. We're still going to go ahead, cut through the body of the coat almost all the way down, and do a little V-cut or Y-cut at the very end to those ends of the stitching at which point I'm trimming away some of that canvas just so it folds a little bit easier, it's a little bit less bulky, and I'm able to start working on the welt. You can see once it's pulled to the inside and pressed and folded down, I can go ahead and stitch it to the pocket bag. I haven't done any of the stay stitching for the pocket welt yet, I just want to go ahead and get everything pressed into place. And now that it looks clean from the inside, I know it's only covering half of the thing, it's fine, that's the way the original I was looking at is done. I'm going to now go back and top stitch those two lines of top stitching underneath the welt again. So this will not only hold down the welt portion, but it will also make sure to strengthen where the pocketing attaches. Then the pocketing can get flipped up into place, the pocket flap folded down, and you guessed it, two more lines of top stitching. So it seems to be a running theme with this. I'm then stitching up the sides of the pocket bag so that way I don't lose anything inside of my coat, making sure that it tacks well up at the corners, and it's time to start the body assembly. So you can see the four main pieces per side here, starting off with the center back seam, which only goes to where it splits down at the skirts, and then adding in the side backs and the sides, and eventually the fronts as well. So everything just gets seamed up, pressed open, making sure that it stays nice and flat, clipping as I need to. And it's time to move on to the collar. I stitch the center back seams on both the wool and the canvas, just like we had before, and I'm overlaying those I have cut the canvas a little bit larger than the final pattern because once I pin along where the roll line is, where it's going to be folded, I'm going to fold it over and then pin down. It means there'll be a little bit of extra taken up in the canvas. So I want it to be a little bit bigger, a little bit baggy by comparison in order to accommodate the fact that it needs to fold. So I always cut this just a smidge larger than it actually needs to be in the finished color. Then it's time for their very quick version of pad stitching. Instead of going in by hand and doing this with great detail, they just simply do two lines right against the center back seam and then do this squiggly line down the middle. I am adjusting the pressure of the foot as you can see there at the beginning in order to make it easier for me to make around those tight curves and swivel back and forth, but there's lots of different ways to accomplish this. The point is, in reality, they would have done it freehand, so don't worry too much about making it perfect. It just needs to kind of hold those two layers together. Then I'm able to stitch the collar in and try everything on. First thing I'm noticing, the lapel is sitting out a little too far from the body, and there's a little bit of pull from underneath the armpits up to the neck, so I need to lengthen the fronts, and I want to add a dart to the lapel. By adding that dart, as you can see on my left side there, your right, makes a big difference. So I let out these shoulder seam about half an inch and added that little dart there, and that will hold it back and hold it to the body. That's why that little dart is so common right there in so many coats. I just wanted to make sure that I did actually need that and made a few adjustments to make sure that it fits. It does mean that technically the lapel is a little bit smaller, but I cut it bigger than I needed to to begin with, and I will adjust that canvas to match up in the near future. Once I'm sure that everything is pressed and top stitched accordingly around the collar area before I start putting in the second layers, because those second layers would be in the way for this top stitching, I am then able to move on to adding the visible external layer of the collar. I am offsetting those seam allowances, as you can see, so that way the top is the biggest. And that way when I fold back everything, there's actually a little lip to it, so that way the edge won't be visible on the actual edge. I can then go in and top stitch right up against that edge, making sure that it won't continue to roll, but there's plenty of excess for when it folds along that roll line, and I'm going to make sure that I accommodate for that as I'm pinning it into place. 
this just makes for such a clean folded collar by comparison to machine stitching the whole thing in as one. This process, I always recommend it. It's a small step for a really big difference. I'm just going in and putting what's going to be technically a somewhat permanent basting there to hold it down into place, but it'll get stitched in by the lining later. I'm now trimming back that canvas to the correct seam allowance edge there. I could technically probably manage with the seam allowance that I have left, but I think that's a better shape. And I'm also adding in the canvas down at the hem as well. This is bias cut, so it's not too resistant, and it allows me to make around the curves without actually having to cut a curved piece and therefore wasting a lot of canvas in the process. So this seems to be a really common element in a lot of women's tailoring around the 1890s. It just helps to keep the skirts from deflating too much. So I've basted the canvas into place on the top edge, and now I'm going in and basting the seam allowance back along the bottom. Then it's time to do, you guessed it, more top stitching. Hooray! So I actually at this point have to top stitch right up against the edge and a quarter inch in around the entire body of the coat, along the hem, up the fronts and the lapels, and it connects there at the corner to the collar. I waited to do the offset quarter inch top stitching for the collar until I had everything assembled, so that way it's just one clean cohesive line. And then I'm ready to start on the sleeves. The these are pretty basic two-part sleeves. They're going to be pretty large at the top, but they're not super fitted or super loose. Down at the bottom, another little bias strip of canvas to help support the cuff area. There's not going to be a separate cuff, but it's a visual cuff with more top stitching. So I'm basting that into place. You could see me a bit ago tugging on it to get the right curve out of it. Again, the benefit of bias cut here, it offers a little bit of strength and a little bit of resistance without being so stiff that it causes a crease in the line or anything like that. So there's top stitching not only down at the very edge of the sleeve, but there's also going to be two lines of top stitching set up about two and a half, three inches, depending on the size of sleeve that you're going for. So that will hold that bias cut strip into place so I don't have to worry about catching it later. We're then on to the lining. I ended up having to go with a silk and cotton satin for this because all of my other options fell through. I actually really like a rayon and cotton mix for this sort of thing. You want a satin preferably, but rayon is such a great place for this, even though historically, I know it's not exactly accurate, but it's a much less expensive option than any type of silk satin. But I couldn't find a better option with the right color, so silk it is. I'm starting off with the sleeves, getting them stitched into place down around the hem of the sleeve. You can see it was set pretty far back from the edge there. And then everything gets basted together up at the top edge, and I'm adding in the gathering lines of stitches. So two lines of gathering in order to get the sleeve head correct. Yes, I'm doing the lining and the wool of the coat sleeve together as one layer. That will help with the size and fullness of the gathers here. And it's not uncommon in this era for the sleeve to be set with the seam allowance towards the body. It's very common. It's a great way to compensate for all of those ruffles and gathers up there. Once the sleeves are in, I'm making up the rest of that lining and it's time to stitch it into place. This is entirely hand stitched. I usually start up at the top to make sure that I get the sleeve openings anchored and the neckline anchored, and then I work my way around the rest of the body, double checking as I go. It's kind of hard to try the thing on at this point because it's usually full of pins, but if you have a particularly wily fabric for the lining that's being difficult, then it might be a good idea to hang it on a mannequin for a little bit of while, or at least on a hanger to make sure that it all settles correctly. But my lining is pretty stiff, so I'm able to go in, get everything placed, make sure it's not pulling in any of the areas, especially around the hem, and it's time for all of the buttons and buttonholes again, using the same little snips in order to get keyhole buttons. The difference this time being that I'm laying down a heavier silk cord. This is heavier than button twist. A gimp would be ideal, but I have just a really heavy embroidery type of silk, and I'm using that to help create some um, pronouncement and shape to my buttonhole. And so it's gonna end up with a very, very fine, narrow buttonhole. So if you really want a super tailored look to it, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. 